So we should meditate on her because she's a Shakti, huh? Spanish Muradharani. So we should meditate on her while chanting. Oh my Lord, Sri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva. Oh, all pervading personality of Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he's independent because there's no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, Appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is uh, forever free from the illusory re representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaitra votra. Dharma projita kaitra votra. Paramo nirmatsaranam satam. Paramo nirmatsaranam. Vedyam vastava matra vastu. Vedyam vastava matra vastu. Shivadam tapa trayon vulanam. Shivadam tapa trayon vulanam. Shimad bhagavate mahamuni krite. Shimad bhagavate mahamuni krite. Kimva parir ishwaraha. Sadyo hide avurudyate tra. Kriti bihi susu subhistakshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, By this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataro galitam falam. 
Sukumakad Amrita Dravya Samyutam. Pibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam. Mohur Ahuratska Bhuvibhavakaha. O expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Svakata Krishna. Punyash Ravana Kirtana. Punyash Ravana Kirtana. Vidyantak Sto Badrani. Vidyantak Sto Yamhadani. To hear, hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures. Or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita. Is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta Prayesu Bhajesu Nasta Prayeshra Bhajesu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge as he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhavo, kamo lo bhadayas chaye, chete etarin avidam, stitvam sattve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lusts and avarice are diminished. And as material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso. Evam prasana manaso. Bhagavat bhakti yogataha. Bhagavat tattva vigyana. Bhagavat tattva vigyana. Bhakti sangha sajayate. When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis chidyante sarvasamsaya siyante chasyakarmani drista evat manishwari Thus, bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come to the stage of a samsayam samagram, understanding of the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, chapter 15, verse number 16. Yado shuma pranitam guru bisma karna. Napri trigarta salya sandaiva balika dayai. Napri trigarta salya sandaiva balika dayai. Aschanya moga mahimani nirupitani. The pras prisurni haridasam ivasurani. No pras prisurni haridasam ivasurani. Translation. Great generals like Bhisma, Drona, Karna, Purishrava, Susarma, 
Salya, Jayaratha, and Balika all directed their invincible weapons against me. But by his, Lord Krishna's grace, they could not even touch a hair on my head. Similarly, Prahlad Maharaja, the supreme devotee of Lord Nishingadeva, was unaffected by the weapons the demons used against him. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. The history of Prahlad Maharaj, the great devotee of Nishingadeva, is narrated in the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Prahlad Maharaj, a small child of only five years, became the object of envy for his great father, Hiranyakashipu, only because of his becoming a pure devotee of the Lord. The demon father employed all his weapons to kill the devotee son, Prahlada, but by the grace of the Lord, he was saved from all sorts of dangerous actions by his father. He was thrown in a fire in boiling oil from the top of a hill underneath the legs of an elephant and he was administered poison. At last, the father himself took up a chop chopper to kill his son and thus the Shingadeva appeared and killed the heinous father in the presence of the son. Thus, no one can kill the devotee of the Lord. Similarly, Arjuna was also saved by the Lord, although all dangerous weapons were employed by his great opponents, like Bhisma. <clears throat> Karna. Born of Kunti by the sun god prior to her marriage with Maharaj Pandu, Karna took his birth with bangles and earrings, extraordinary signs for an undaunted hero. In the beginning, his name was Vasusena. But when he grew up, he presented his natural bangles and earrings to Indradeva. And thenceforth, he became known as Vaikartana. After his birth from the maiden Kunti, he was thrown in the Ganges. Later, he was picked up by Adirata, and he and his wife Radha brought him up as their own offspring. Karna was very charitable, especially toward the Brahmanas. And there was nothing he could not spare for a Brahmana. In the same charitable spirit, he gave in charity to his, his natural bangles and earrings to Indradeva, who being very much satisfied with him, gave him in return a great weapon called Shakti. He was admitted as one of the students of Dronacharya. And from the very beginning, there was some rivalry between him and Arjuna. Seeing his constant rivalry with Arjuna, Duryodhana picked him up as his companion, and this gradually grew into greater intimacy. He was also present in the great assembly of Draupadi, Swayamvara function, and when he attempted to exhibit his talent in that meeting, Draupadi's brother declared that Karna could not take part in the competition because of his being son, the son of a Sudra carpenter. Although he was refused in the competition, still when Arjuna was successful in piercing the fish target on the ceiling and Draupadi bestowed her garland upon Arjuna, Karna, the other disappointed princess, offered an unusual stumbling block to Arjuna while he was leaving with Draupadi. Specifically, Karna fought with him very valiantly, but all of them were defeated by Arjuna. Duryodhana was very much pleased with Karna because of his constant rivalry with Arjuna. And when he was in power, he enthroned Karna in the state of Anga. Being baffled in his attempt to win Draupadi, Karna advised Duryodhana, Duryodhana to attack King Draupada. For after defeating him, both Arjuna and Draupadi could be arrested. 
But Dronacharya rebuked them for the, this conspiracy, and they refrained from the action. Karna was defeated many times, not only by Arjuna, but also by Bhimasena. He was the king of the kingdom of Bengal, Orissa and Madras combined. Later on, he took an active part in the Rajasuya sacrifice of Yudhisthira. And when there was gambling between the rival brothers designed by Sakuni, Karna took part in the game. And he was very pleased with Draupadi, uh, when Draupadi was offered as a bet in the gambling. This fed his old grudge. When Draupadi was in the game, he was very enthusiastic to declare the news. And it was he who ordered Dushasana to take away the garments of both Pandavas and Draupadi. He asked Draupadi to select another husband because being lost by the Pandavas, she was rendered a slave of the Kurus. He was always an enemy of the Pandavas. And whenever there was an opportunity, he tried to curb them by all means. During the Battle of Kurukshetra, he foresaw the conclusive result and he expressed his opinion that due to Lord Krishna's being the chariot driver of Arjuna, the battle should be won by Arjuna. He always differed with Bhisma, and sometimes he was proud enough to say that within five days he could finish up the Pandavas if Bhisma would not interfere with his plan of action. But he was much mortified when Bhisma died. He killed Gatotkacha with the Shakti weapon obtained from Indradeva. His son, Rishasena, was killed by Arjuna. He killed the largest number of Pandava soldiers. At last, there was a severe fight with Arjuna, and it was he only who was able to knock off the helmet of Arjuna. But it so happened that the wheel of his chariot stuck in the battlefield mud. And when he got down to set the wheel right, Arjuna took the opportunity and killed him. Although he requested Arjuna not to do so, Napta or Burishrava. Burishrava was the son of Somadatta, a member of the Kuru family. His other brother was Salya. Both the brothers and the father attended the Swayamvara ceremony in Draupadi. All of them appreciated the wonderful strength of Arjuna due to his being the devotee friend of the Lord, and thus Burishrava advised the sons of Jitarasta, not to pick any quarrel or fight with them. All of them also attended the Rajasriya Yagya of Maharaj Yudhisthira. He possessed one Akshahini regiment of army, cavalry, elephants, and chariots. And all these were employed in the Battle of Kurukshetra on behalf of Duryodhana's party. He was counted by Bhima as one of the Yuta Patis. In the Battle of Kurukshetra, he was especially engaged in a fight with Satyaki, and he killed ten sons of Satyaki. Later on, Arjuna cut off his hands, and he was ultimately killed by Satyaki. After his death, he merged into the existence of Vishwas, Vishwadeva. Trigarta o Susharma, son of Maharaj. Rida Kshetra. He was the king of Trigarta Desha, and he was also present in the Swayamvara ceremony of Draupadi. He was one of the allies of Duryodhana, and he advised Duryodhana to attack the Matsya Desha Darbanga. During the time of cow stealing in Virata Nagara, he was able to arrest Maharaj Virata. But later, Maharaj Virata was released by Bhima. In the Battle of Kurukshetra, he also fought valiantly, but at the end he was killed by Arjuna. Jayadrata, another son of Maharaj Ridhakshetra. He was the king of Sindhu Desha, modern Sindh, Pakistan. His wife's name was Dushala. He was also present in the Swayamvara ceremony, Draupadi, and he desired very strongly to have her hand. But he failed in the competition. But since then, 
he always sought the opportunity to get in touch with Draupadi. When he was going to marry, when he was going to marry in the Salya Desa on the way to Kamyavana, he happened to see Draupadi again and was too much attracted to her. The Pandas and Draupadi were then in exile after losing their empire and gambling, and Jayadratha thought it wise to send news to Draupadi in an illicit manner through Kotishasya, one of his associates. Draupadi at once refused vehemently the proposal of Jayadratha, but being so attracted by the beauty of Draupadi, he tried again and again. Every time he was refused by Draupadi, he tried to take her away forcibly on his chariot, and at first Draupadi gave him a good dashing, and he fell like a cut root tree. But he was not discouraged, and he was able to force Draupadi to sit on a chariot. This incident was seen by Domya Muni, and he strongly protested the action of Jayadratha. He also followed the chariot and threw that reika the matter was brought to the notice of Maharaj Yudhisthira. The Pandavas then attacked the soldiers of Jayadratha and killed them all. And at last, Bhima caught hold of Jayadratha and beat him very severely, almost dead. Then all but five hairs were cut off his head. And he was taken to all the kings and introduced as the slave of Maharaj Yudhisthira. He was forced to admit himself to be the slave of Maharaj Yudhisthira before all the princely order and in the same condition he was brought before Maharaj Yudhisthira. Maharaj Yudhisthira was kind enough to order him released. And when he admitted to being a tributary prince under Maharaj Yudhisthira, and then, and when he admitted to being a tributary priest under Maharaj Yudhisthira, Queen Draupadi also desired his release. After this incident, he was allowed to return to his country. Being so insulted, he went to Gangatri, in the Himalayas and undertook a severe type of penance to please Lord Shiva. He asked his benediction to, def to defeat all the Pandavas, at least one at a time. Then the battle of Kurukshetra began and he took sides with Duryodhan, Duryodhana. In the first day's fight, he was engaged with Maharaj Dropada, then with Virata, and then with Abhimanyu. While Abhimanyu was being killed mercilessly, surrounded by seven great generals, the Pandavas came to his help, but Jayadratha, by the mercy of Lord Shiva, repulsed them with great ability. At this, Arjuna took a vow to kill him, and on hearing this, Jayadratha wanted to leave the, water field, the war field and ask permission from the Kauravas for this cowardly act. But he was not allowed to do so. On the contrary, he was obliged to fight with Arjuna, and while the fight was going on, Lord Krishna reminded Arjuna that the benediction of Shiva upon Jayadratha was that whoever would cause his head to fall on the ground would die at once. He therefore advised Arjuna to throw the head of Jayadratha directly on the lap of his father, who was engaged in penances at the Samanta Panchaka pilgrimage. This was actually done by Arjuna. Jayadratha's father was surprised to see a severed head in his lap and he at once threw it to the ground. The father immediately died, his forehead being cracked in seven pieces. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So again, we see that if a devotee takes shelter of Krishna seriously and dedicates his life to pleasing the Lord, especially by hearing and chanting. And this is explained in the uh, prayers to, to the uh, personified, prayers by the personified Vedas. And uh, the personified Vedas say, Dear Lord, it is very difficult to achieve perfect knowledge of the absolute truth. Your Lordship is so kind to the fallen souls that you appear in different incarnations and execute different activities. You appear even as a historical personality of this material world. And your pastimes are very 
nicely described in the Vedic literatures. Such pastimes are attractive as the ocean of transcendental bliss. People in general have a natural inclination to read narrations in which ordinary jivas are glorified. But when they become attracted by, your, by the Vedic literatures, which delineate your eternal pastimes, they actually dip into the ocean of transcendental bliss. As a fatigued man feels refreshed by dipping into a reservoir of water, so the conditioned soul, who is very much disgusted with material activities, becomes refreshed and forgets all the fatigue of material activities simply by dipping into the transcendental ocean of your pastimes. And eventually he merges into the ocean of transcendental bliss. The most intelligent devotees, therefore, do not take to any means of self-realization except devotional service and constant engagement in the nine different processes of devotional service, especially hearing and chanting. When hearing and chanting about your transcendental pastimes, uh, when hearing and chanting about your transcendental pastimes, your devotees do not care even for the transcendental bliss derived from liberation or from merging into the existence of the Supreme. Such devotees are not interested even in so-called liberation, and they certainly have no interest in material activities for elevation to the heavenly planets for sense gratification. Pure devotees seek only the association of paramahansas, or great liberated devotees, so that they can continuously hear and chant about your glories. For this, can, can, for this purpose, the pure devotees are prepared to sacrifice all comforts of life, even giving up the material comforts of family life and so-called society, friendship, and love. Those who have tasted the nectar of devotion by relishing the transcendental vibration of chanting your glories. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. They do not care for any other spiritual bliss or for material comforts which appear to the pure devotee as less important than the straw in the street. So here is a great emphasis on Engaging in devotional service in the nine processes, but especially hearing and chanting, as we're doing right now. And it says, when hearing and chanting about your transcendental pastimes, your devotees don't, do not care even for the transcendental bliss derived from liberation or from merging into the existence of the Supreme. So, this is a very important point. Uh, because the uh, the uh, most people engage in hearing and chanting about mundane people and hearing and chanting about mundane subjects like politics, economics, social sciences, and so forth. But if they can develop a taste for hearing and chanting about the glories of, of Lord Krishna, then they attain perfection in this life. And like Arjuna, they're protected by the Lord. And this is what we recite also every morning. It says that one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling in the heart of every living being or in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. So, this should be the culture in the temple, and it should be the culture in everyone's house. The culture of hearing and chanting about the Lord. Because then one becomes purified. You don't need to go on pilgrimage, you don't need to uh, do different sacrifices and rituals. All you have to do is regularly hear and chant about the Lord's transcendental activities and his holy name, etc. And one becomes purified. And when one becomes purified, at that point one becomes steady in devotional service and begins to experience transcendental bliss all the time. And 
and at that point they lose their taste for material sense gratification and they relish more and more enthusiastically hearing and chanting about the Lord. So in this way, one can attain perfection in this lifetime very easily and one result of that is that Krishna will protect the devotee and also empower the devotee to do wonderful things in devotional service. This empowerment is immediately experienced when one becomes successful in preaching Krishna consciousness and inspiring others to become devotees and basically uh, spreading this movement uh, in, a, in a, a dramatic way. So you can see how Prabhupada was able to do this miraculous establishment of Krishna consciousness movement in Western countries and in India and uh, spread the movement all over the world. He had this empowerment because of his taste of hearing and chanting. In fact, one time he was with his spiritual master and his god brothers in Vrindavan and they were all sitting down uh, listening or getting ready to listen to a class by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and then and someone came in and announced that whoever wanted to come and visit the seven uh, major temples of Vrindavan and have darshan of the deities should immediately come and join the group and leave uh, that room that they were in. And almost everyone got up and walked out. But Srila Prabhupada did not. And then there was a few other sannyasis who did not. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur noted that Prabhupada remained there. And he said that uh, I don't, I don't know the exact words, but uh, the, the gist of it was that uh, because Prabhupada was interested in hearing from his spiritual master, the spiritual master would would bless him. So that is the essential symptom of a devotee on the fast track to doing wonderful things for Krishna. The devotee is very anxious and very interested in hearing the words of pure devotee like Srila Prabhupada or Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and relishes that more than anything else. That's the real pleasure and real vocation and real preoccupation of a devotee. It's a hearing and chanting. And, and then Krishna guarantees that he will protect such a devotee and also endow the devotee with wonderful qualities so that the, such a devotee can spread Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> and also, uh, when such a devotee develops a taste for hearing and chanting, uh, and, and that's called ruchi, first there's, uh, there's uh, sadhu sangha, uh, and, and there's uh, appreciation of devotees and then sadhu sangha associating with devotees and then in the association of devotees learning the tremendous value of becoming initiated by a bona fide spiritual master and then under the tutelage of the spiritual master clearing away all anarthas or bad habits and then one develops nista, strong faith and from there one develops ruchi, this avid taste to hear and chant every day about Krishna and his transcendental pastimes and his holy name, etc. Once one develops this ruchi, this taste, uh, they can never let go of it. And they, their real pleasure in life, so some people, their real pleasure in life is going on a vacation to Las Vegas or Disneyland or something like that or Montana but the real pleasure of a devotee is being able to sit down and hear and chant and participate in classes 
and give classes also. Uh, this is the real pleasure of the devotee. It doesn't need television, it doesn't need movies, doesn't need Disneyland, doesn't need Las Vegas. But he cannot avoid hearing and chanting about the Lord. So, uh, the more we hear and chant, the more we become convinced that this is my real life, this is my real preoccupation in life, I don't need anything else to be happy, and one becomes successful in all their preaching activities. That is uh, the, what we can learn from today, and the result is that one, one can become not like Arjuna, but in some ways like him, empowered by the Lord to do wonderful things. All glories to Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? subject matter, with the best subject matter to hear and chant, and what does it mean hearing and chanting? The best subject matter? Yeah. Okay. Best subject matter is Krishna's uh, pastimes, how he's relating to his devotees. I mean, we're doing that right now. We're hearing and hearing about Krishna's relationship with uh, Arjuna and the Pandavas. We heard about Krishna's relationship with Narada Muni, Krishna's relationship with Bhisma Pitamaha, Krishna's relationship with uh, Vidura, with Kunti Devi, and so forth. That's what we're doing. We're hearing all these pastimes of the Lord, his entrance into Dwarka and, uh, and Vyasadeva, right? We've heard all these things so far up to this point. So if somebody is uh, so much inclined to hear this pastime interaction um, between Krishna and Devore, and one is a complete chanting holy names, you know, like engaging chant chanting holy names, which is just names. There's no pastime there, it's chanting every Krishna. Oh no, there is pastime there. Well, I, I mean, extended people, like, hearing, like, we're hearing now, right? We're hearing the story, there's some substance there. And then the ones who are just hearing just the repetition of chanting. So how would you uh, equalize, you know, the same hearing chanting? Well, when you hear the glories of the holy name. That's, then that means you're associating with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and, and his whole Sankirtan movement. You know, the reason I'm saying this every, every time there's a name of Krishna, there's a pastime. The reason I'm saying Krishna, this. Krishna's name means he's the most attractive. Why is he most attractive? Because he has six opulences in full. He has, he has uh, eight uh, uh, you know, Asta cities and Astaguna, and uh, Sad Aishwarya. So as soon as the name of Krishna is said, all those things appear. The reason I'm saying is, um, uh, was there such an occasion? I was preaching in Eastern Europe. Yes. And uh, it was in the Baltics, uh, specifically in the Italian. <laughs> Estonian. So we have this festival. I think it was a Thayatra, and then uh, we have a tent, and uh, we suppose for people to come hear kirtan and also a uh, lecture, uh, uh, short lecture, something like this. So it was given by Trivikrama Swami, who was there. So I was leading kirtan, and Maharaj came, he was trying to come and give some speech, you know. <laughs> then uh, everybody's just Disappeared. Got up and walked out. <laughs> and then when the Kirtan... They came back. They, they, they said, Oh, Kirtan, more Kirtan. My say, you see, what can I, I can't speak so... The interest in the Kirtan and the chanting and the holy name. So, is that because they 
your fight mentality? Or what? Well, it's better than not uh, coming to Kirtan. No, but the, the Kirtan, I mean, you were talking about the Lithuanians, right? The, the, the people, the normal people. Yeah, including devotees. Including devotees, yeah. And we're interested in, in, in you know, singing Kirtan, holy name, basically. So. Well, uh, see, Prabhupada was given an opportunity to go and, and have parikram of seven major deities in Vrindavan and go with the God brothers, and they would be chanting on the way and so forth, right? But he chose to sit down and hear from his spiritual master. So everybody walked out. There's just a few sannyasis and Prabhupada, right? So because uh, Kirtan is very wonderful, you know, it's, it's, it's the whole, it's the Yuga Dharma. But sometimes, like, uh, you can see... Uh, uh, for example, uh, Narada Muni was invited to a Sankirtan party organized by Daksha. And it, at that time, he was a Gandharva. He was not, uh, uh, not yet Narada Muni. Uh, but uh, he went there, and he sang very nicely, and he was surrounded by women. And they were all jumping up and down with their breasts going up and down their hair falling all over the place and and he was enjoying it and he was cursed to become the son of a, of a Sudrani for that misbehavior in other words they were using the kirtan he was using the kirtan as a sort of you know for pratista and for the type of sense gratification rather than uh, glorifying. glorifying the Lord Right. So sometimes you see, you know, uh, some new person comes and when there's kirtan, they start dancing, you know, in a strange way and, you know, and, and acting in a bizarre way, right? So it, it, they're having sense gratification, just like they would at a, at a, at a uh, uh, you know, a, a rock concert. However, uh, when one develops this taste for hearing then when they go to chanting, they chant in a very sincere way, not not showing off. They Surely, can, yeah. yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, Haribo. I have, I have yeah. a question, I have yeah. a question which is out of context. Yes. Because we, 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 we decide every morning that because of the Supreme Lord, you, the material universes, appear to be real, although the, they are unreal. So now, our philosophy is, and is, is that the creation of this material is not false, it's not illusion. So here, in this, in the, in the one we decide every morning, it says that although they are, they are unreal, so uh, how can we... Yeah. Uh, the, they're unreal in the sense they're temporarily manifested. They're, they're real while they're manifest. Can you read the, the whole thing again? So only because of him do the material universe is temporarily manifested by the reaction of the three modes of nature appear real, although they are unreal. unreal. So while they're, while they're manifest, they appear real. But when they become unmanifest, it's unreal. See, in the full sense of the term, you have to go to the verse in the second chapter of uh, Bhagavad Gita. Na sato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sata, ubayor apidristo natas twaneas tatvadarsavihi. So that verse is very important. It says, uh, verse number 20, uh, 16, yeah. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, the material body, there's no endurance, and of the eternal, the soul, there's no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. So, Prabhupada says, but the spirit soul exists permanently, remaining the same, despite all changes of the body. 
and mind. That is the difference between matter and spirit. By nature, the body is ever-changing and the soul is eternal. This conclusion is established by all classes of seers of the truth, both impersonalists and personalists. So the body is made of material elements and it is under the uh, control of the modes of material nature, right? So the material nature or gunamai is, is, is the world of three, uh, you know, gunas. So that world has a beginning and an end. This world, this material world, has a beginning and an end. Therefore, it is real while it, it's manifest, but as soon as it is not manifest, it's not real. So therefore, devotees, when I, when I say it's not real, everything you see in it, the buildings, the roads, the bridges, the airplanes, and including the people, right? As soon as it's unmanifest, uh, it's it's like a dream. It's it's not it's, it's, you you it doesn't have continuity. So therefore, uh, devotees are always interested in sat. They're not so interested in asat, other than to use what is temporary in the service of the Lord, but not to enjoy temporary things because that whole process is unreal. Unreal in the sense that it's not going to last eternally. Now, what is it that people want? Everybody wants that the body be eternal, that the house be eternal, that the country be eternal, that the car be eternal, right? But it, it's not possible. So uh, they're acting as if they're going to live forever, but yet they get old, they get sick, and they die. And then their youth is like a dream. It's not, it's not real anymore. They just can remember it, but they can't experience it in, in the same way. So the matter at one point is going to disappear. So when it disappears, you suddenly realize that it's, it's a dream, everything you experienced. Just like your car, at one point you get rid of the car because it, it's, not, you, it's not functioning properly, right? So now you can only remember that car, but you can't, in, you can't drive in it anymore. So it becomes unreal in that sense. But I, I, I relate too much in the, in the, way, the way Prabhupada is saying that our philosophy actually says that uh, on defeating the Maya body, Maya, Maya body concept that everything is illusion, unreal, basically that's what the Maya body says. Everything is illusion. But our philosophy is that this world is not uh, Maya, but it's temporary. The creation is not Maya, but it's a temporary, you know? So it's, one sense is real, because it's a temporary, but it's not unreal, no? All the forms are not real, because they're going to disappear, and they're constantly changing. Like your form as a child mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. is no longer there. Right. You're still there, but you're in a different body, you see. Mm. So that, therefore, you as a child right now is unreal. You, you can't go back to that position in that body. It's not, it doesn't exist anymore. So, although it looks real and, and it, for some time, right, if you don't use it in Krishna's service, it's actually unreal because it, it's not going to give you any result that's continuing. Ah, I was going to come to that point. Because I was, exactly, I was going to ask, I was going to ask if it's something is there, or the creation, but it's been used in the service of the Lord. Yeah, then it's, then it's real, because okay. the result of it stays with you eternally. Again, second chapter. Uh, what is it? The 40th verse. So this says that, yes, 40th verse. In this endeavor, there's no loss or diminution, and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. 
So Prabhupada says, activity in Krishna consciousness or acting for the benefit of Krishna without expectation of sense gratification is the highest transcendental quality of work. Even a small beginning of such activity finds no impediment, nor can that small beginning be lost at any stage. In other words, the benefit, any work begun on the material plane has to be completed, otherwise the whole attempt becomes a failure. But any work begun in Krishna consciousness has a permanent effect, even though not finished. So that, that's real. It has a permanent effect. So the next time you start devotional service, let's say in the next life, you start from the point where you left off. You don't start from zero. Because you did something that was connected to sat. Right? It's like the way people make progress in the devotional service. Yeah. And, and progress, life, life, after life. life after life. So, so I, what I think what you're saying is summarized in what we discussed the other day. Everything that appears real, like light, reflection of light in the darkness. Yeah, that's unreal. <laughs> so, Mathieu... You don't actually see the real object. Right. You just see some shadow of it. So, when we call material universe as being unreal, means it's not useful. Well, everything in the material universe exists in the spiritual world, but in the real form. Right. Whereas here, it's only a shadow of it. Uh, Yeah, just like you can see right now the shadow of my hand right there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's light and, it, and it's projecting a shadow, right? But if I try and shake hands with the shadow, it doesn't work. But the shadow exists, uh, the, uh, the shadow implies that there is a real hand somewhere. Okay. You see? So there is a real world, but it's not what we're seeing here. Yeah, oh, that, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Let me write again. Yeah. As, no, it's not a mirage. There is a shadow, right? You can see it right now. You, right, right there, my shadow of my hand, I can see the five fingers, okay. right? But if I try and interact with it, there's nothing there. It's just air, right? But the shadow implies that there is a real hand. So this material world implies that there is a spiritual world. Otherwise, you wouldn't, we wouldn't see it. It would, it would not have any existence. But whatever you're doing in the material world, it's not real activity unless it's devotional service. All the other activities is false. It's, it's illusory. Yeah. Because it's not eternal. I mean, the forms, the, the energy is eternal, but the forms, the bodies, the trees, all these things, they're, they're not eternal, so they're illusory. Yeah. Now you see it. Now you, in the next minute, you won't. It's like there were the twin towers in New York City, you know, yeah. and then the next day they're not there anymore. <laughs> and, and when they were there, you think, "Oh, this is permanent." But it's not permanent. And and in a, and after a month or two, they took all those rocks and windows and and uh, you know uh, metal that was uh, all uh, twisted on it, they took it away and then there was nothing there it was just a flat flat land whereas before there was the gigantic buildings and people thought oh that's that's solid you know that the, the stock market was there there was so many people there were thousands of people in those buildings now it's just air so so therefore what seemed to be real is actually an illusory so it's as much as when we see... Why? Because it wasn't being used in Krishna's service at all. So what about we see people, many people are disappearing, dying. The same, you see people, people we knew, but they're no longer there. No, no they're, they, they are somewhere, but the, their body... Well, I mean, they, they form, yeah, yeah they form, it's not they, there they, anymore. They, yeah. they form, they have accepted this material. Yeah. But it's no longer there. No. no. It's just in the memory. No, even... Like, for example, you can keep try and keep the body in your house. You say, I want to keep a granddaddy in the house. But eventually it'll disappear. It'll, it'll fall apart. Right? So why wait, you know, 50 years for it to fall apart? You just bury it or burn it or get rid of it because it's, the person is not there. Hari Bhagavad Gita, Shila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.